And we're back. Here we are. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So we're back in studio today. How was your weekend, Ed? Ah, uh, it was relaxing. Yeah. Mother's Day weekend. It was. It was an eventful weekend, to say the least. We had uh, space junk hurtling back to Earth. There was uh, an awesome fight. Carnelo Alvarez won, all right. There was a tragedy in New York City and Times Square. And then, yes, it was Mother's Day. So shout out to all the mothers. Hi, Mom. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're back in studio. Uh, we're going to discuss DIY, decanning your catalytic converters. Now, mm -hmm. full disclosure, decanning isn't for everybody. So why don't you enlighten the listeners and viewers about decanning and who should be decanning their catalytic converters? Well, if you look at the market, place for selling used converters from the generator, whether it's the um, automotive repair all the way through automotive recycler. Um, the typical business model was to sell them by the piece in the can to a collector. Uh, would probably go through uh, several layers of collectors to get to a processor and or a decanner and then get shipped off to a processor. Um, if, if you're generating a small amount of material, it's not uh, not advised to decan. Keep them in the can because you can identify them right. and you can sell them based on the part number or the um, the uh, category. Typically, these days, it's by part number. The mm -hmm. old days, it was by category. Um, you really need to have about 600, 700 converters uh, to get a lot large enough to get into the smelter. Right. And uh, probably generates you about 11, 1,200 pounds at that point of loose catalyst. So a generator that can accumulate to that point or generates that volume um, of about 600 converters, that's, that's typically the breakoff point. Yeah. And that's really how they're going to reach the top of the market for their catalytic converters, Well, we correct? talk about the top of the market. I mean, if you're selling them in the can, you're selling them by the piece per, per code value mm -hmm. versus an accumulated quantity of decanned ceramic monolith and having that um, milled, sampled, and assayed and paid out based on the contained ounces of platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Right. So that's the top of the market right yeah. there. And then if you're not selling your converters on assay, then uh, you're, you're selling at uh, a lower value because there's a handler in between you and the processor or the or the uh, the company that does the milling and the assaying. Right. That makes sense. So obviously volume is key, so it's not for everybody, like we said. Right. You know, if you're yeah, generating... Don't decan your 10 converters right. and expect someone to pay you top dollar for it. It's right. not going to work. Right, because there are minimums at the smelters. Right. Each smelter is different, but right. like you said... How do you, you know, identify the value of 10 pounds of loose catalyst? You can't. You can't. Yeah, you have I mean, absolutely it's, no it's, way of knowing what's in that. Well, you can get it analyzed, but the cost of that is is high. So right. you need to do that on a large volume. Right. So let's jump into it. Let's let's break it down, the details of decanning. So obviously, first and foremost is safety. So can you explain the safety for the operator, what that looks like? Well, your operator should be wearing... Um, you know, adequate uh, protection for uh, the uh, particulates that are in the air, you know, the dust. And so, you know, you should be wearing a, a device that's providing a filtered, cool, fresh supply, full face mask, hood. Protect that operator. Protect that sure. operator. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's glass or plexiglass that's over their face. So they have face eye protection as well. So that's incorporated in that. The other thing would be an appropriate smock, maybe something that's heavy-duty leather in case some metal shoots out. Right. And then also you need to have some decent gloves. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even like a, a welder's mock yeah. or something yeah, like decent, that, right? Yeah, decent heavy-duty smock. Long sleeve, sure. good gloves. Absolutely, yeah. That's very important. You want to protect the operator. So the next uh, detail that we could talk about is the proper shear. Now, what do you suggest the best shear using and decanning your catalytic converters? Well, I don't know that there's a best shear to use. <laughs> I know that there's better shears than others. Uh, I don't think that alligator shears are suited for this. Uh, I, I believe that the, uh, the guillotine shear is uh, the most appropriate. Whether it's single piston or dual piston, that's up for debate. Um, also, uh, the size of the, the shear, the pump, 10 horse, 15 horse, 
20 horse. Um, it just depends on the, t the type of material that you're decanting and the, and the speed with which you're, you're trying to accomplish that job. Right. Now, what about like the um, electrical for these typical shears? I mean, can you just buy one? Is it plug and well, play? Well, it's not a 120 no? volt single phase system. Right. <laughs> Can't plug it into no. the garage outlet, right? right? No. It has to be, <laughs> it's three, be three phase, phase power. Three phase power, generally 208, 230 volt. 460, 480 dual voltage on the motors. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, so we got safety. We got the proper shear to use. Now, let's talk about collection. What, in your opinion, is the best way to collect all this loose catalyst once they're being decanned? Well, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I always recommend that someone... Um, use a super sack to collect the loose catalyst that they've decanned and uh, maybe put that super sack inside of a galor to give it some rigidity um, whether it's during the decanning or after the decanning process prior to shipment you want to make sure that super sack gets into a galor to a, a yeah. 40 by 40 box protect it while right. it's being transported yeah, drums are not going to hold very much weight no. And you don't want to decan directly into a Gaylor box because you'll lose material because they're right. They, they're not they they don't seal well. So yeah. yeah. So super sack so inside a Gaylord box, bag obviously it. metal banded to the pallet, maybe bag put it, a cover tag over it, it and ship it. That's right. Get it in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, ventilation. That's very important. Well, that's probably one of the most important areas uh, for safety. You want to keep your shop clean. Uh, you don't want to have dust everywhere, so dust collection is extremely important. Some people actually build a room around their decanter, their their uh, shear, uh, and uh, it keeps that out of the other work environment. Maybe they have a warehouse where there's storage, right. so they build a little room around that area just for containment purposes. Yeah. But if you have a decent dust collector, uh, you, these particles are extremely small, Um we usually recommend you get a, a cartridge type bag house filter mm -hmm. um, that goes down to about a half a micron, 0 0.5 microns. Wow. That's very small. That is very small. And um, pull ventilation from the front and the back of the blade. So if you could, you know, bifurcate the flow mm -hmm. and use a dust collector that has about 2,500 CFM or greater. Any less than that, you're not going to have a decent um, collection effort. Yeah. And yeah. that's very important because obviously there's a lot of profit in the dust. You don't want to be losing the dust. But also as a, as a safety measure, you want to also be protecting the operator. Well, we've analyzed uh, the decan material. We've analyzed what comes out of the dust collector. The dust collector is about a third higher value because – when you look at the way a catalytic converter, uh, the ceramic monolith is is constructed, it's 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 dip coated, so the precious metals reside on the surface. Right. So as soon as that gets cracked by and crushed by the um, by the decanter, the shear, it emits a dust cloud, and that fraction right there is where the precious metal is. Right. So that goes right up to the dust collector. Right. That super fine fraction, which is the that. highest value. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, what about maintenance? Is it, is it hard to maintain these shears? Well, for operator safety and ease, you want to keep that blade sharp. So keep it sharp. Yeah. Probably Prop works quicker too, yeah, right? Yeah, a, lot, a lot of companies use an angle grinder just to, you know, give it a tune-up every, every, say, 150 cans that they, they decan. They'll run that angle grinder over there and mm -hmm. sharpen that blade up again. Keep it greased. Uh, that's really important. Check for loose uh, hydraulic hoses, uh, especially the filter. I've, I've seen filters just blow right off and make really? a huge mess. Oh, my god! Because with every cycle, there's always a... The pressure. The, the pressure is on, off, on, off. So the, you get this vibration. So you got to be careful about that filter coming loose. That makes sense. Working this way loose and then blowing off, and then you got a 10 gallons of hydraulic oh, fluid on the floor. So that's you want to avoid fun. that situation from <laughs> Yeah, that, that's not fun to clean up no, that hydraulic so keep, fluid. No, so keep everything tight. So, you know, check it, uh, you know. Every couple of days, I would say, you yeah. know, and make sure it's not just dripping and making a mess. And don't don't get lazy and stick a rag down there to catch the drip. Yeah, that's not Check good. those fittings. Absolutely. And if you have a leaky hose, then uh, maybe you should replace it. Right. Right. Common yeah. sense. Yeah.
And also maybe the the level of the fluid that's in the tank. Well, too, you know, it's right? interesting. The fluid in the tank, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I wasn't thinking along those lines, but the fluid in the tank is two functions, right? It's for the hydraulics, right. for up and down, right? right? But the reservoir of the tank is generally 25 to 40 gallons, depending on the size of the unit. And if that thing runs all day long, it acts as a coolant, coolant right. to the system. It absorbs the heat that's generated through that process. So it keeps the hydraulics cool. That's good. And people don't even realize that. Right. That's a very important. So if you got a 25-gallon tank, don't put five gallons in and expect to operate it for <laughs> eight hours. Yeah, that's not going to work. You're going you're gonna, to uh, overheat the system. You right. need to have that 25 gallons in there. Right. And another thing to mention with the guillotine type shear that you were talking about, it has a head block on there. Do they use the head block to help when they're decanning? Yeah, absolutely. You know, typically you, you you're going to um, slice that converter open, you know, slice that converter open, turn it on its side, put it, pull it back from the sh from the blade, mm -hmm. bring the head block down on it to open it up, to cru it crushes the monolith at the same time that the, the squeezed can gets opened up again mm -hmm. before you knock that material out. So it really aids in, in, in the, uh, quickly getting that crushed material out of there. Very good. Yeah, yeah. And some people don't even realize this, that if you take a, a, a blade and put it onto a cast iron converter, you could chip that blade, bend that blade, break that blade. Oh, yeah. You can break iron, that blade. Cast iron is strong. <laughs> yeah, I know one one company. Uh, we asked them how they handle those cast irons. They said, "Oh, well, we just decan our entire lot, and then we get down to the we save out all those cast irons, and at the end we start to hit it with the blade, and then okay, the blade breaks. It doesn't matter. We're going to replace the blade, and they keep on using that broken blade to crack those cast, cast iron. iron units open. Wow. And I asked them, well. Why aren't you just keeping the cast irons away from the blade and just using the head block? Because cast iron is brittle, it'll shatter. Yeah. Oh, we didn't think about that. <laughs> I just say, how many blades the last couple of years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and blades aren't cheap, right? No, not Typically, cheap. what do the blades run uh, price wise? Well, it depends on, I mean, you can get them for about $450 up to $1,000, depending on how the big size. a blade you need for your unit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and they'll 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 last you a while. I mean, they just get shorter and shorter. Yeah. Yeah. How long do you think they? You can even send last? them out to get uh, resharpened if you want, but but you could get a few uh, loads through, right? On on a single blade, typically. What do you think? Yeah, I would say you probably should be able to get it between five and seven thousand cuts on a blade. Yeah, that's that's some good numbers, right? Yeah, there. those are good numbers. Yeah, the economics are in favor of it. Absolutely, definitely. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our sit down. Yeah, looking forward to some more episodes. So thanks again for your time. Great. Thanks everybody for watching. Like, subscribe, and share the videos. All more right. to come. Okay. Thank you.